Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the uh, penultimate talk today. Um, today's talk is going to be by Franz Rosen. Uh, he's going to be talking about attacking modern web uh, technologies. So um, over to you. Thank you. Let's see if my mic works. Also, um, awesome. Uh, welcome. I'm going to talk about attacking modern web technologies. It's a sucky name, and you could probably do like that, like modern. So the thing is, uh, if you say, like, I'm going to talk about new uh, web technologies, that sucks because nobody's using that. So my idea about the talk was basically to talk about modern because modern is what people use. Um, my name is Franz Rosen. Um, I try to call myself the Swedish Nina. It's a douchebag move, but the, the reason why that is is because every time I show people outside of Sweden this profile pic, they're like, yeah, you're dressed as a Nina, you're a hacker. Uh, but it's like super cold in Sweden, so that's why I have that image. I work as a security advisor on Detectify, and we're doing light automation. We have a booth, booth 17 outside of this room. Um, I do a lot of bug bounties. I use that as an R&D, like research and development to enhance our product. Um, right now, I think I'm number seven, but it's like weird point system. Uh, no no, no um, bad feelings, hacker one. Uh, I do a blog post at uh, our lab's blog as well. I like to do live hacking. I've been to a bunch of live hacking events, and I try to um, do good at them. I will talk about some bugs uh, on these, from these events, but I won't like disclose who it is or whatever, so I will try to keep it isolated. And not all of them are from these events. Anyway, the rundown for this is that I'm going to talk about something that is not modern, uh, but I will just try to explain why I want to talk about it. And then I'm going to refer to it inside the upload policies, which is something that I've been talking about for the last weeks. So there's some stuff disclosed there. Then I'm going to do a deep dive. This is the interesting thing of this talk. I'm going to do a deep dive in post message implementations and talk about some really fun bugs. So it's going to be like client side race conditions, some leaks extracting data, abusing sandbox domains. That's the fun part. So we're going to like rush through the other things. And if we have time, I'm going to share a tool as well. So app cache, not modern at all. It's like super old thing. First, a disclaimer. Uh, last AppSec, File Descriptor actually talked about this specific vulnerability. But bear with me. There's a reason why I'm talking about it. Uh, he found it independently of me and Matthias of Lidinbrun, Matthias Carlson. Uh, we found it separately uh, from each other. So we, when we saw it last AppSec, we were like, oh, no. But yeah, we, we also have some pretty fun stories about it. So App Cache. App Cache is basically a way for your application to cache data on, on your site, which means that if you have like a manifest on your, on your website or in your DOM uh, and points that to an app cache, you can tell uh, that if the browser gets offline, for example, uh, it's going to cache these files so it still will serve them even though your browser is offline. The replacement of this is, of course, service workers. That's like the proper way of doing this. But this is like the old version of service workers. And when this was implemented, security people were not invited <laughs> to that meeting, uh, as you will see. So the thing is, um, this is how it looks like. There's also something called a fallback inside this manifest. Fallback means that whenever you can't reach the website that you want to cache, uh, the fallback will actually uh, point to somewhere else and we'll serve that file instead. So this means that uh, whenever you access a URL on a site that has app cache uh, and it can't reach that URL, it will use the fallback. The interesting thing here is that I talked about like being offline and that's why you're using the fallback. The interesting thing is that if you get an error 500 on the website, that's the same thing as being offline. So that means that the fallback will be used as well. Uh, which means that if you were able to like, make the site, the URL that the person visits on this site, make that one trigger an error 500, the fallback will be used. So how do you do that? There's a technique called cookie stuffing or cookie bombing, which basically fills your cookies so that the request you're doing to the site is huge. Like it's, it's, it's gigantic. Which means that every time you hit a domain using cookie stuffing, it will error out in a 500 saying like, oh, this request is too large for me. So the bug that we found was basically this. If you have a manifest with a fallback, 
you could actually, even though you see a, the manifest is placed inside a path on a domain, on this domain you have a manifest inside a path, and on that manifest you're saying the fallback for everything on this domain should fall back to my file next to me. This is really bad, <laughs> because this means that if you can install a manifest inside a path down on a, on a domain, you can install a fallback for all the paths on the same domain. This means that if, if you have like user uh, paths having like specific things for specific users, you can actually install a fallback for all the users inside this. And the reason why th this was a bug in every browser was because the specification was so vague. It says like manifest can only specify fallbacks that are in the same path as the manifest itself. What that means is like up to you to, to, to translate into yourself, but what people thought was that, okay, so the manifest needs to be next to the fallback endpoint. That was all what all the browser assumed, but that meant, it really meant that you should not be able to have a fallback for a path that is not the same one as the manifest is being installed in. So that's one of the big reasons why this happened. So this might sound like gibberish to you, so I'm actually gonna show you a demo of how this works. So this is a live demo, not a live demo because it's fixed now, but it, this is on dropbox.com. So dropbox.com, just to like give you a preparation of this, dropbox.com had a public directory which you could, sh like if you put stuff in that public directory, you could have a website on dropboxusercontent.com. Everybody had the same subdomain, dropboxusercontent.com. What happened was that we found a way to use an XML site, an XML page, using a manifest on that page, pointing that to a manifest on, in the same directory, saying, please uh, use our, our, our other XML file, and when that XML file is running, we're gonna take a JavaScript in the XML, because you can, of course, run JavaScript in an XML file, uh, take the URL that you're trying to access and log it to my external server. So we're gonna see right now, this is my screen, I'm on dl.dropboxusercontent.com, and now I'm gonna visit this site that installs the manifest. So you can see in the DOM that I have a manifest and a cookie bomb, which basically is the things I need. So what I'm doing right now is that I'm installing the manifest, this is how the uh, manifest was installed. Now I'm gonna access a totally different file, and it's gonna alert me and saying, this is your file. I'm gonna go to dropbox.com now, go to a website and download an image. Download this, just go to this. Because I now have the app cache, I now took the URL of that site. And I can also go to my logging site and look at the log and see that here, here is the URL for the Dropbox. When we sent this to Dropbox, they were not that happy. <laughs> because they thought that they had made every mitigation they, they needed to actually uh, make this not work. One of them was using a CSP called Sandbox, which is supposed to isolate you from doing anything at all. Uh, however, the manifest is still allowed on Sandbox. That was one of the bugs that we actually identified when reporting this. So, the whole bug was you could run XML on the yield of drop, Dropbox user content.com as HTML, that one installs a manifest. That means that every file downloaded from Do Dropbox would use the fallback HTML because of the cookie bomb, which would log the URL sending it to us. So we could download every file you had in that site. App cache never expires, by the way. So this was just a persistent, unless you're like wiping all your, um, your storage on the, on the site. So every secret link would be leaked to the attacker. They paid out pretty good for it. Uh, so me and Matthias received $12,000 to this thing. But not only did they pay for this, they actually went to all the browsers and like coordinated together with us, telling them that you need to fix this. So Dropbox did their own mitigations. What they did was basically no more XML, HTML on dldropboxusercontent.com. They also removed the whole functionality of a public directory because that was like a legacy thing then they didn't want to use that anymore. They coordinated, as I said, with all the browsers. They also made it uh, so the, all the browsers does, does not support fallback pointing to the root. If you're inside a path with a manifest, you can't install the, the, the app cache on the whole domain. Also, they're trying to like deprecate the whole app cache so it doesn't work anymore. And also Dropbox added, so you have like random subdomains. So even though you get an app cache installed in one, you can't attack another one. 
Um, all the, the browsers surprisingly actually fixed this. We reported it back in February last year, and they fixed it around June. Even Safari and Internet Explorer fixed this. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, woohoo! We also got some bounties for it, so that was, that was pretty fun. Uh, but the, the, the cool thing is like the mitigation it did was the fallback path. You couldn't escape to the root. So app cache vulns is still possible. Uh, they added a really, really important mitigation, HTTPS only. Like it doesn't, doesn't matter in this case. It's like, of course, HTTPS is going to be used. Um, so if you have files uploaded and they can run HTML, could be on an isolated sandbox domain, same, same thing as uh, Dropbox. Um, and, and files are uploaded in the same directory for all users, um, you could basically use this. Uh, also, the big brother of this, you can do exactly the same thing. Service workers, they have some mitigations. They, they expire. If the, if the service workers um, uh, aren't there anymore, they will expire. But you can basically get them to renew anyway. So the service workers work the exact same way. If you have a bucket and you upload files for different users in the same path, could be isolated from your own domain. Someone can install um, app cache on it, and sometimes service workers. I think they've added some mitigations to service workers. You need like a header and shit. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still possible. So going from this, the non-modern things, I'm going to talk about upload policies. This is like the only thing in my description of this talk. But this is not the thing I want to talk about. But I will go through it anyway, because it's, it's awesome. So, the way to upload files uh, using S3 and, and Google Cloud before was basically you took the uh, binary to you or the image or whatever, and then you uploaded it to S3. Uh, but they realized, like, okay, can't we do so the client themselves upload the file directly to S3? And they thought about it and they said, like, okay, so we have a policy, and if you upload that policy together with a signature and then upload that together with a file, if the file follows the policy, you can upload it. Uh, so that was a pretty smart move. Uh, problem is it's super easy to do wrong. That's like the main issue with this. So a policy upload looks like this. It's basically posting to an S3 bucket together with a policy, signature, access key, um, and some other parameters depending on the policy. So if you see here the policy, it's basically a base64 JSON. The JSON contains all the rules of the file that should be uploaded. I would say that probably all lines in this policy can be abused, uh, which is quite bad. So just some common pitfalls in this. And this is specific to AWS, this specific <coughs> policy rule. But it looks similar in, in Google Cloud. So for example, if you have starts with key, key is basically the file name. If you have an empty starts with, that means that you can replace any file in the bucket because the policy says, Whatever file you want, in whatever directory you want, wherever in this bucket, you can place it wherever you want. So this is a really bad one. Another one, referring to the last one that I talked about, the app cache and service workers, is that if you have a starts with and a key, but no path separator, that means that they can store stuff in the root of the bucket. And if you don't know about S3 buckets, S3 buckets has two ways of accessing them. Either you have the bucket name .s3 amazonaws.com or you have s3 amazonaws.com slash bucket name. But having the one with the subdomain, the, the bucket name .s3, you can actually do this thing with app cache that I mentioned. So that's super bad. Also, content type. If you have a content type with empty starts with, this is super common, you can upload HTML files, of course. Uh, depending on, you can also have a rule on the content disposition, um, and if you don't have that, you can basically upload whatever. So you can have like an inline um, file, meaning you can run HTML. The funny thing is that if you're even using start with together with a MIME, you can just fool a browser to just use text HTML anyway. So if you have like starts with image JPEG, you can just add image and then a format that the browser won't know about and then a semicolon and text HTML, and it will use text HTML. So they, these two are just as bad. <coughs> and um, looking more at the like, upload policies, when, when you think about the policy, so what, what this means is that you need to have a policy served for each user. Because if you point everything to the same path in the policy, people can upload uh, files, uh, like override other people's files. So you need to have something that provides a custom policy for the current user. This is when, where shit starts to happen. Because people are building custom business logic around how to provide a policy. 
This is a, a, a good example of how it can actually go wrong. So in this case, you have a user upload to a website, and what happens is that you give it a MIME, a content type, and a file name, and when that happens, you get a signed URL back. The problem is, as you see, this is like specific down in an upload file. Everybody can use the same directory. So you can op op like override files. And also remember, if these files are private, meaning you need a signed URL to actually access them, but you know a file name, like invoice1.pdf, you can just provide it with invoice1.pdf and get a signed URL and just download it. So then you get access to everything and people getting crazy about that. Of course, you can get access to whatever every file you want. The thing is, custom policies sucks. Um, and trying to roll in your own policy logic around this, like providing it, is such a bad um, environment out there. Like looking at it, it's like so easy to do wrong. Um, the thing is, the, good, the, the thing that you wanna do to wanna achieve is that you wanna go to the bucket root. If you get a signed URL to the root of the bucket, you get the file listing of the bucket. In a, in a normal setup, you get that. So we're back to the 90s. Like this is an example of uh, a, a website where you say, I wanna have this image, please, and it will give you back a signed URL. The problem was that when you give, give it like path traversal, this is back to the 90s, like when you did path traversal through file uploads, uh, it will actually normalize the URL and give you back a signed URL to the root folder of, of the bucket. So you have full read access to every object plus uh, object listing. You can do whatever you want. Another one was they were trying to, with regular expressions, to extract the URL from the, the URL you gave it. So basically, you gave it a URL saying example bucket and the director and the file, and it would insert it back into the URL and give it a signed URL. The bypass of that was basically just like fiddling around with a bunch of data, and suddenly you get like, uh, as I said, the, the two different formats of S3 is that you can have S3 and the bucket name as a directory. This means full access to every object. Another solution, another one that, that I enjoyed very much was basically you gave them a key and said, please xx11 should point to the S3 key slash. What happens then is that it says, okay, we created that, everything is cool, xx11 points to uh, slash. And then you went to their site and slash files xx11, and that one redirected you back to their bucket. The problem with that bucket was that I, I, I think I had like two gigabytes of file listing until the, the, like, I was like, I will never get the whole file listing of this. This contained everything of this company. It was crazy. They had one bucket and that was everything. So I reported this to a bunch of companies. The funniest one was basically one that said like, this is the worst thing ever and here's $25,000. That's like the worst. Okay. I'm done. Let's deep dive in post message. I love post message. Okay. So one year ago. I talked with a guy called Fight. Fight was here, and we talked about like, it would be nice, like post message, it's like hard to find, it's like very obscure, it's like really like hard to identify. We should like build an extension. And when I came home from AppSec, AppSec last year, I was like, I'm gonna do it. Uh, so my plan was to build a post message tracker that catches every listener in all frames. So if you know about post message, you know probably that the Chrome console, for example, can show you the message listeners. Surprise, surprise, it only shows them for the current window you're currently in. That means that if you have 12 iframes with 200 listeners, you won't see them there unless you're changing your current scope of your window. I also wanted to find the function receiving the message. And I also wanted to log all messages uh, from all frames between each other. And I succeeded, I actually made up a Chrome plugin. So ba basically when you go to a website, you get like a notification of how many post message uh, trackers you have, in what frames they are, and you can also see the messages getting passed between these uh, listeners. Um, this was quite fun because I realized like I've been missing out on so many listeners inside an iframe, inside an iframe. Google Tag Manager installs like a script running and inside that one there's a little iframe having a listener and then provides data back to the, the main, main window. So I found a lot of stuff. If you saw Jim's talk in here before, um, he showed you like Eval is like the XSS as a service. I found that. <laughs> it's like, oh, 
oh, you have a message for me. I'm just gonna run it into Eval. Uh, which means that you can have a payload saying like, okay, Eval, can you just alert the domain, please? And that's what's happening. Uh, some more like complex solutions to it, like this. Like if you provide it with a JS load script uh, property, uh, you can basically make it load uh, JavaScript. So you provide it with a .dot URI and then just say, please run JavaScript, and this is my JavaScript. I've found some more complex cases. This is my, one of my favorites. So instead of looking at like how to XSS using post message, I'm trying to think about how can I like use post message without having any XSS to extract data from your website. I found a really cool service called Clicktail. This is fixed now, so I'm not like disclosing anything broken. Um, is someone like, can someone see something bad with this one? I'll give you a hint. It's the re regular expression in here. So the problem here is that the dots are not escaped, and dots in a regular expression means anything. So my demo of this was basically to create a Q QA core app x clicktail.com, which is a domain that doesn't exist, but still applies and passing this origin check. So that was my first like, okay, I can bypass this. What now? Give me something fun to play with. And I got this one. And starting to look at it, I'm like, this is super boring. Like I can provide it with like test rules. Like, what the hell is test rules? And I was like, should I, should I spend the time looking at this one? Like it's all about like doing breakpoints and going down the code and realizing what the hell is this code doing? So I was like, okay, let's do it this time. So I started looking at it, and I saw that as soon as you provide this JSON with test rules, it will initiate a bunch of uh, factories, uh, constructors from actions, observables, and states. And I was like, oh, I'm really gonna dig down in this and trying to understand this. I never looked at any documentation. I was just totally looking at this. I would have been probably easier to look at some documentation, but I didn't. So um, I saw this and I'm like, okay, I can construct something. That's super interesting. I started looking at the actions one and I saw that I could provide it with like events, um, but I had no idea what it does. So I just d dug down deeper and I found this switch. And this made me really curious. So I could provide it with options uh, and what it would do is basically trying to fetch those options. The, the funny parts of this was basically everything. Like everything was super interesting. The one that I actually ended up using, I think, was like element value or uh, JS variable value. Uh, the thing was, I had to understand everything. I couldn't just point to the action, like give me this. Because you had, as I mentioned, triggers, and then you also had like uh, states. Uh, so I started constructing this. I realized that you need a trigger, something to trigger the rule. And I found one of the rules being a delay. So I could wait five seconds and it would trigger the action. The problem was you need a state also, you need something. So I first started with this and I realized, okay, can I do something that I really know exists? So yeah, I could use JS variable exist and then say, is this the domain you're running on? An example of com was the domain, so that one passed. And then it, it went funny, because then I realized that I could use a test rule event, an action saying that, please use the element value with a query selector. So I was basically, I found a way to extract whatever you want using this post message listener to extract all the data I wanted on this site using these three action state and, and uh, triggers. So basically I made like a proof of concept, sending the message telling them, please use this query uh, selector give me the CSRF token, and ta-da, I got it. So that was like, this was so complex. I spent probably like two or three or four hours on this, just like trying to figure out what the hell was going on. But this was super exciting. Um, next one was basically XSS on an isolated but trusted domain. What does that mean? You're isolating it because you're not trusting it, right? Yeah, but the sandbox domain was not only used for insecure content, <coughs> It was also used to convert documents uh, being uploaded on the trusted domain. They used a converter on the sandbox domain. The reason for that is that they didn't want to use the converter on the trusted domain because the converter was not trusted. Pro the problem was that the post message was used to transfer data between the sandbox domain to the trusted domain. And that's pretty interesting because, as I said, it's uh, insecure. They don't trust anything on this domain. So, the document service looked like this. Create a new document, that's it. I found the XSS on the sandbox, and I basically used this XSS 
to open a new window because they get their relation between each other. Uh, you can't do anything. They are totally different domains, so they don't have any access to each other. However, when you click on create new doc, that one created a little iframe with the listener of the conversion. Uh, so that one is passing data down to the iframe. The cool thing is that that iframe and my XSS site has the same domain. They can talk with each other. I can even access all the JavaScript inside this iframe because it's the same origin policy. That's how it works. So when someone uploads something on this domain, that data gets transferred down to the iframe to convert it into a proper document. I then hijack that JavaScript and make it send the data over to me, which means I get the user content, just because they went to my site and then decided to upload a file, which was a lot of fun. Another thing I've been looking at is something called client-side race conditions. I, I have no idea, like, I've, I've not heard about it before, but it's, it's probably a lot of vulnerabilities that you can raise on the client side. But what I noticed was that post message has some interesting uh, properties that actually make this uh, a lot more possible. So uh, one site that I found was basically when you went to the website the first time, you're basically getting a script that is loaded. Like there's a, there's a JavaScript being loaded. And that script is when that script is loaded, it's going to launch an iframe. And that iframe is going to tell you what language you will be presented with, like super weird locale service. But it was pretty interesting. So if you see here from the beginning, the listener was launched before the iframe actually replaced the data. Um, and starting looking at this one, it's actually looking at the origin. The worst, ma the worst check of the origin you can ever see is index of. That's like, if you're not checking the origin, index of sucks completely. Because index of says, is this in the beginning of your domain? Yeah, it is. OK, so I just add this, the domain as a subdomain of my own. Uh, so link.com.example.com is a valid origin using this index of. Never use index of in your origin checks. Strict origin checks every time. The problem was that the listener, uh, when the origin passed, this listener showed up. What it does is basically loading a JavaScript file and embedding it. You can't control what domain it's loaded, uh, so you couldn't do that. And also, it has a limit. It can only load one script, and then it will die. So what I found with the script was that the parameters that was loaded, that is like over here, they actually was not sanitized. So you could provide it with data in the parameters that would uh, uh, not be escaped. So you could actually add your own parameters. So I started looking at this script. And what it did was basically load a script like this. Um, and I found that there was a parameter that was not being used in the script, but a parameter called OSL that you could inject in this JavaScript, your own JavaScript in it. So I'm escaping the variable inside this JavaScript. The problem was I didn't have OSL. But remember, currency was not escaped. So I can actually provide it with, uh, with a, a person and then OSL and then inject that parameter. The problem is they decided to like, alert should not be used. Like, don't ever think in that way. Like, there's no reason to like block alert. Just to show how bad it is, I'm actually like, I'm gonna write a bypass for this. Like, it's super easy to do. Uh, you're basically creating a new iframe element and then steal the document from that and then, or the window alert from that and then just use that one instead. So in the end, I have a link.example.com. Uh, you open the website to this site. I'm going to stress it so much. Like every 10 milliseconds, I will send a message telling them that the currency is actually a person OSL and a function uh, restoring the alert function, uh, and then just alerting document domain. The thing is, whenever you access this site, it's going to load the JS file. But because I'm stressing this so hard, the iframe that will actually run this one, I will get before that one and steal the initiation of this one running the XSS, which is fun. So I was racing that JavaScript to load the iframe, and I came in between. So the, the race condition here is basically post mess between the JS load and the iframe load. I was able to inject that. And it worked in all browsers. That was like, it, that's how it's supposed to work, like because there is some waiting time between the loading of the iframe and the, and the JavaScript. Another client-side rates condition I found, which was funny, and this is a, this is a complicated one, but we'll, we'll try to get through. This was the listener. Can someone spot a bug in this? OK, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the replace here 
uh, is a very common mistake, but the replace means replace the first dot. So in the end, this will mean that if you have this uh, example.co.nz, it will just replace the first dot. Can you find the next bug? <laughs> it's actually the, the hint was the co.nz. So if you look at Wikipedia on .nz, in 2015, they decided to remove CEO as a requirement for companies. So you can re register a .nz yourself. That means that we can actually create an example, .nz that will be passed by the, this one because the only replacement on the first dot. That one will actually pass. And example ACO is conveniently available <laughs> to register. So that means that this website that had the listener basically works like this. Uh, you have a food site that you can subscribe to getting recipes and uh, uh, like shit, I have no idea, I've never subscribed. But <laughs> what happens is when you press subscribe, it's gonna open an iframe and they have a PCI certified iframe that they call foodpayments.com. Classic thing, like we're gonna sandbox our PCI certification because we don't wanna pay for a PCI certification for our whole domain. So we're just gonna have a PCI certification on one this domain. So what happens when the iframe is loaded, the mainframe will send an init call to this iframe. And that's just to say like, hello, are you awake? Are you awake? The iframe, when it's loaded, will receive this message and say, oh, the origin of this message is okay. I approve. Uh, I will also save you as the, the target of every message I will send in the future. And I will also tell you that I've been initiated properly. The thing why they do that is because in the mainframe, they have a function that says uh, that they have a timer that if it doesn't get an init in a couple of seconds, it will fail and say payment failed. So as soon as it gets an init call, from the, 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 the iframe, it will actually, okay, all is okay, don't kill the frame. What happens after the all okay, don't kill the frame, is that the mainframe will say, okay, please load Stripe. And please load Stripe together with uh, our public key of our Stripe account. The thing is, uh, this is because they wanna have a geolocated payment providing website, so the main site is providing the user data where it should initiate. So we could initiate like a Braintree payment or a Stripe payment or whatever. Um, and the iframe will say that if I'm already in it, like I got the init call, and you're trying to load um, a provider, I will initiate that provider and I will kill the message listener. This is basically the same as the first one. You can only do this once. Did you see the bug? <laughs> The problem here is that I can ex open my example aco.nz, which passes the origin, open the I like food website that says please subscribe. The user will press subscribe, open the iframe. I will start stressing the iframe, uh, sending this post message into the iframe because that's totally valid. Post message is a course functionality, cross origin resource sharing. So I would say, please use this key, please use this key, please use this key. And it's like, but I haven't in it yet. Remember the init check for the load? I haven't in it, I haven't in it. And then the message between the, the mainframe and the, the, the child frame will say in it, in it, in it. But I'm stressing there, sitting there with load, so I will get in between. And it will load my key instead in the iframe. What happens then is that basically you get this Input, like, please enter your credit card to subscribe to I Like Food. You enter your credit card, and it will say it failed. The thing is, the reason why it say it failed is because the I Like Food website can't validate that the payment went through. But Stripe will have, in my log of my Stripe account, the token key. Because it was successful on Stripe, but whenever I Like Food wanted to validate the payment, it's just a different account, because it loaded my iframe instead. So I can use that token now, and it's a subscription. I can charge whatever I want on this card. Uh, it's actually like, and I'll also capture the money. So the interesting thing with this one, I tried it for a very long time, and I realized that the post message from an opener between two other post message calls, it was like nothing running in between those calls. Chrome was the only one actually allowing that. Firefox did not. So this is probably some form of browser quirk that, that makes Chrome uh, available to this injection of a post message from a completely different place. Here's a guy with a horse. <laughs> so when building this post message tracker, 
I had a, a, a bunch of speed bumps. Like, I wasn't done a year ago. I've been like trying to solve these speed bumps on the way. So one of the problems I found was basically there's a bunch of function wrappers out there. They're being used to track how the website performs in terms of function calls. So they are wrapping every function you have on your website and calculates the time between those function calls. That's why you can go to New Relic and say like, how long does this JavaScript function take uh, to load? So when you start looking at the post message listeners inside Chrome console, it would look something like this, and everything is pointing to NR wrapper. And in the beginning, when I started using this, I ignored it for months. I was like, this is something that they're just tracking something. But then I realized, like, depending on the website, you had more and fewer of these. So I was like, is this really something? And I realized, hell yeah, that's all the listeners in there. Like, you're not going to see other listeners. So what I did, what I found the wrapper, my extension actually finds the wrapper, and I jump over it. And then I provide the JavaScript back with the original function, uh, and I do that recursively. So you can have Raven, Rollbar, Bugsnag, New Relic together, and I will unwrap all of those, which means that even in the console, in the Chrome console, I'm enhancing the user experience to actually look at these post messages, which was like mind blown for me. Like that was like, one, once I found that, I was like, okay, so everything I thought did not have any listeners, they had a bunch and they were just like so broken. So that was one of the speed bumps and one of the solutions. Another one I had was jQuery. <laughs> like the gyms talk like jQuery, everything is wrong. Um, this was how all the jQuery listeners looked like. And jQuery is a mess. Uh, it's also a mess because it's like changing for every version of, uh, uh, of jQuery. So I had a bunch of ways to solve it and I ended up in having uh, three ways, like I can use like a data object on the jQuery, an expando object, and an events object. And then I was able to actually unpack the real listener. So when you go to the website that has this jQuery, it will show the jQuery listener, but I will also unwrap the jQuery. So I will use those two as, as a tracking because I don't get the stack trace from the expando because the function is not being called. But I can actually unpack it so I can see all the listeners. The hardest problem I had was basically anonymous functions. So you can create like anonymous functions inside JavaScript. And I, I totally didn't know about that one being uh, like a special little breed in Chrome. So in, in like a couple of months, like probably I sold this in like January. So for a half a year, I had 12 listeners on a website. Um, and then I disabled it and I saw that there were 14 of them. And I started looking at it and I'm like, okay, I can't solve this. Like the problem is that Chrome will not tell you what function it is. So that's why I was missing them. But now I can actually find them and say, there are two uh, anonymous listeners in here, uh, but that's it. The thing is Firefox has uh, this, you can actually f fetch the function and get it. But uh, Chrome just decided that, that no, you will not be able to get that as a, as a string. And I'm using the function to string to, to get the function. So have I released it yet? No, I, I suck. Like, it's so much fun. Like, I, I really like ended up in being like a, 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 a deep dive in like what could I like add to, to this. So I like I have so much feature I want to add to it, and I have some ideas. Like, I want to be able to like trigger the debugger as soon as a message come in. I can actually trigger the debugger specifically for that message, so I can modify it. And since I own the order of all the listeners, I can actually do that. Uh, I also want to see if the origin is being used. We had a discussion on this on Twitter. Uh, I think it was Cotto and, and uh, Eduardo uh, from Google, uh, trying to see if the origin property is being checked. Uh, also, if you know about Rex, Rex is an amazing little project created by M Microsoft um, Labs. And what, what Rex is is basically a binary, and you provide it with a regular expression, and you provide it with a char set and it will give you a solution to the regular expression. So I built a little tool that takes a regular expression of a domain or a URL, and then it will fuss it uh, until, like I think it's Python I'm testing with, until Python th thinks it's a totally different domain. So then I can validate the regular expression and see if I can es escape it to another domain. So that's something that I really want to like embed to this. Wow, 141 slides, I made it. Thank you very much. I have one more thing. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. I have one more thing that I wanted to share. I'm going to cut this off the live stream. So, one, 
more thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it. So I have a little tool. I won't release the post message tracker right now. If you're really, really nice to me, maybe I will give it to you. Uh, but uh, I have another tool that I wanted to share. Uh, it's, it's quite fun. So we did a project back in, uh, I think it was last year, we did a project about S3 buckets. And the problem with S3 buckets was basically that they're vulnerable. That's it, like end, period. The thing is, you can hide your S3 buckets behind like CloudFront or a CDN service or something. So I thought a lot, lot about like, how can I decloak these things? So for you guys and girls, I'm releasing my S3 bucket decloaker uh, on this uh, URL. So what it does is basically checking with, I think it's five or six uh, different ways. This is basically like read the fucking manual uh, because the manual says if you're uh, sending invalid signatures, we will say how it failed, and we will also disclose the bucket. So it's not like a zero day in S3. It's just that I read the manual and like, okay, I can use this, uh, these checks to actually decloak the, the S3 bucket. The cool thing with this is that you can actually find if someone using a reverse, reverse proxy on site, like example.com slash files, and files is served on an S3 bucket, you can find that bucket as well. So it's actually gonna check what domain or what path is the actual S3 bucket and then use these hacks to actually find what bucket it is. It has been uh, very good for me and I hope it will be for you as well. Thank you very much. Hey, I think we've got about two minutes for questions. Woo! So one or two questions, anyone? No questions. Mine. There we go. This is good exercise. Uh, what browser is the plugin made for, or is it cross-browser? Chrome. Chrome only. Um, no big reason, I think. I, I think if, if you would port it to Firefox, you would actually get all the anonymous functions as well. So my guess is uh, it should, there's nothing like Chrome specific in it uh, at all. It's just that I've been finding the, like this is a, a, a um, it works really well together with the, the breakpoint solution of the Chrome console. So I haven't found like a really good way in Firefox, for example, to see the, the functions and make breakpoints and shit. There's probably like in Firebug or something, but I haven't done the, the research of it. Um, so, and the problem is I really wanted to do this for Chrome extensions, but a Chrome extension doesn't have access to other Chrome extensions. So I'm screwed there. I don't, really don't know how to actually solve that one, but that would be amazing. There's a lot of Chrome extensions listening and using post message but you can't really use an extension to monitor other extensions, unfortunately. This side. Okay, I think this is it. Uh, let's, thank you. Uh, everyone, thank Franz Rosen for an amazing hacking talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>